um, there was an interesting discussion at the at the end last time, and I want to pick up on that a little bit before we go on through his career, and also I want to. Um, give you a nicety so that you you can sail through life knowing what other people don't all know, which is that Manet is not an impressionist unless you're dealing with um, the kind of broad sweeping generalization that all French art of the last decades of the 19th century are called impressionist. He never exhibited with them. He didn't exactly... Um, well, he didn't. A number of them were his good friends, but he he had his own very singular vision and singular way of vision working that is what inspired the other artists like the subsequent Impressionists. And it was evident from very early in his work that he put in front of the public something that was so provocative um, because he was trying to do what I was calling the impossible, which was to maintain and to honor the whole tradition of the history of art, which he knew very well from both visiting museums and through his travels in Europe. <clears throat> With the call of Baudelaire and like-minded thinkers, that it's time for all musicians, writers, artists to, be, to wean themselves off this backward looking existence and to um, face the fact that this is a new and modern world, a completely different era, which has a different standard of beauty that lives by, at a different tempo that has life organized in a different way. So it would call for artists to work in a different way and to show different subjects. Well, how do you do that if you're also maintaining the past? <clears throat> so the point that um, at the end was leading some dis discussion were the areas where what Manet does is so, well, on the one hand, it looks clumsy or something that's certainly a head scratcher, that things that we might, they don't make coherent sense in the terms of the physical world. Now, for the public, it was just looking at this subject in itself, where for them, well, for us, it's, you know, it's a familiar work of art and it's sort of quaint, these gentlemen. But these were guys, possibly this one would be recognizable to a few people, in what was <clears throat> clothing of the 1860s of young men, young students, um, so it was absolutely contemporary and others might recognize the woman who was a model used by other artists, not just by Manet. And so these are real people in real contemporary clothing, enjoying a picnic, where? Uh, so there was that some people like, oh, well, is this, this did this is this a transcription of an actual event? Um, and then for others, it's like where because they don't really look like this is in any kind of real landscape at all. Where's the light on the leaves? Where does the you know this is so ill formed here? How how does that work? <clears throat> so. I'm going to, this is from a, a scholar writing now about it, um, but here's a way that, that the, the issue is presented. The old idea that all works should be brought to a certain level of finish is based on a belief that the meaning of a picture rests directly on the story portrayed. And you see, people were like flummoxed by what is the story here? Um, the formalist idea now, that would be thinking essentially 20th century artists more formalist, thinking about the forms, the light, the color, the arrangement, the brush stroke. The formalist idea <clears throat> that a deeper kind of meaning can be expressed through abstract placement of forms, textures, and colors 
regardless of the subject, represents the opposite extreme. By mid 19th century art uh, could no longer be thought of as a simple matter of imagination versus perception, mind versus senses. Um, <clears throat> this is in that very uncomfortable in-between space where it both seems to refer to the outside world, but then to be so strongly structured and imagined by Monet in formalist senses, uh, some of which I did not bring out last time because I sort of, well, I'm not exactly playing the devil's advocate, but I put myself and presented it to you as if you were someone coming upon this in an exhibition in the 1860s. And the formalist part might be just to observe the sheer geometry of the placement where all of this can be circumscribed by a triangle that one leads right into the other. And there you can also see it as also going back, if it goes back or it goes up on a diagonal from the still life through her, through this, through this. So that would be looking at this, remembering most of all that this is an absolutely flat surface. All of this is just a fantasy to think that any of them, no matter how Corot might present a landscape as if you could walk into it, you don't walk through canvas. <clears throat> so it's um, kind of the objective reality is that no, this is somebody has taken, picked up a brush and paints, wielded the brush, wielded his thinking to produce something like this. And I also then, so that, that's the major one. But then I myself, continuing to think about this, looked at this model who was well known to people, Victorine, and he uses her in a number of paintings we'll see yet today. In that very frank, utterly unabashed uh, way that she looks out at us with a kind of smile as if like, uh, is it a smile of invitation? Is a smile of complicity? Are we amused by these two gentlemen here who are, you'll notice, not exactly the same size as she is. She's somewhat smaller, especially than him. <clears throat> I think I would also like to imagine that this is Manet smiling out at us like, and what do you make of this? And then as was, was mentioned last time, you can go down and walk through a scene like that. If you go to the grounds for sculpture, which is um, near Trenton, and there are, especially I think of uh, many impressionist works, they're, they're reproduced in sculpture. So you can go down there and that gives me goosebumps. <laughs> I just find it so hard to look at that. And the same for the Olympia. Now the subject much as that's related to Titian and Venus figures, it is also very much that prostitution, um, the plight of many of the young women coming to Paris in the second half of the 19th century uh, was very much a social topic at this time. Uh, so it it's again, the combination of the past and the present. Again, look at how this works as a composition. How here you have an inv inverted V, of course, but how is it that this is cashmere shawl under her? Why should that come down and then come up just where her feet are? So that you have a nice shape here, this nice and curved. And in contrast, it emphasizes her very real, very knobby knee. Why this beautiful hand against the white? Why this hand we sang before, which is very much like a paw. And even this hand, which is of course um, a bringing into life, oh dear, well. 
I guess I won't. Bringing into life uh, Titian's Venus. But this is also very strange. Uh, for me, it was like a, always a perceptual difficulty. Here you have three things. So that's the space between the thumb and the finger, but it looks much more as if there ought to be a digit there. Because you don't ordinarily see the space there, the webbing in that exact pattern. So there are, there are oddities here too, as the size of this arm compared to her, you know, just the bulk of that arm compared to her torso. And the very perplexed public. But they nor the emperor had no trouble accepting this Venus. Is she floating on water like that? No, it's just as obvious that she's on some bed or stand and then he has painted water over it. But because she is done in all the light and shade that we think of as aspect of, of the real world uh, and where you cannot see any individual brushstrokes, it's like, that's easier to accept. Here too, that nice triangular composition. Or Courbet, when he did this, the artist studio, when <clears throat> it was to be all the eras before him and all the people who inspired him. There was never a collective like this in a vast studio, nor did he have a vast studio like this. I was just remarking with someone at the beginning last time that it took me forever to recognize how these figures are all smaller scaled than over here. Well, that's if you were thinking of them as being even fictively in the same space, but it's a compositional necessity because it makes the size, the weight of what's going on over here counteract and balance what's over here. It's an artistic decision. So then just at the very end, we saw um, Manet who is really intrepid. He, he, tr he tries everything. In fact, when, the little I have found of his, his writing about his own work is or prescription for any artist is that no one should ever do the same thing twice. That, that you want to be always pushing, exploring um, within yourself, within your art, what you, what you do. So when he did this dead Christ, the year after he did those Olympias and um, the picnic in the grass, he seems to have been drawn to themes that had death. And it can be on a, on a sort of an instinctive psychological level. I mean, he was really wounded by the reactions of the, the public to, to his works. But um, there was also even in... Um, religious studies in the 1860s, 50s, a new realism that, that was now not to think of Jesus so much as a spiritual figure, but what was Jesus's life like? How much of what's in there can we, we imagine this was life in the Holy Land at this time? What were the social relationships? How did they live? How did they make their money? Um, so uh, this new reimagining as a historical, more truly historical figure, um, Jesus then is, is just consonant with what he's doing. Although what, what one of Manet's friends pointed out to him is that uh, you're gonna get some feedback from people because you have the wound on the wrong side. So, you know, he's, he's not so much following the text, but he is like a dead body. So, ah, uh, yeah, what would a cadaver look like? And he presents that and his own very lovely images of angels. <laughs> One critic got bent all of shape saying, oh, whoever saw an angel with blue wings, to which the answer, of course, was whoever saw an angel. And in that same year, he did this one of a, um, it was, uh, is now we just, just called the dead Toreador, 
it was about 1865, let's see, 1966. I think that's more, I want to say. 65. And this is in the uh, National Gallery in Washington. It was, it was from a much larger painting called um, Incident in the, at, in the Bull Ring. So it's another way he's exploring that theme of being gored, being gored by the public. Very handsome, just this little trickle of blood. I want you to see that partly because now it's quite um, agreed upon by people that are scholars that this little painting, which is in the Frick, is from what was the the large original, from which the Toreador came as well. Monet had a practice a number of times in his life when he would just cut up a painting and sometimes take segments out and uh, work them over as individual paintings. So that's another part of how you, uh, you can um, think more about, he's, he's not thinking of these as a as a scene, uh, as a narrative scene, but as an image. And that part, uh, I don't like that over there. I'm gonna cut that part out or mm, I can save this part and not that part. So it's a, it's a quite different and sort of physical way of looking at it. So we know um, in France, there was such a fashion for anything Spanish and so Mane does a number of works related to that, and I'll show you one in a minute. But now responding also to that Baudelaire, do something from the moment. This is the battle of the Alabama and the Kearsarge. It was a battle in the Civil War, which took place just off Cherbourg. Um, the French were largely, um, at least in that area, they were on the side of the south. And um, the commander of the Alabama, I think, was someone who was sort of lionized in the French press. Now, Manet did not see the battle, but he got all the latest newspaper clippings about it. <clears throat> so <clears throat> this is the Alabama going down. You can hardly see the Kearsarge. Here comes a rescue boat to rescue some sailors in the water here. <clears throat> and there's a tug coming for rescue as well. So he's taken whatever he can get in the way of eyewitness accounts and is producing a large painting out of it. This is about, um, about five feet high. The subject would be appealing, but the presentation was where he's doing something quite new and quite a challenge because most of the canvas is just water. Now this is a French 17th century um, naval scene. It's actually, it's not a battle scene, but you have those kind of great skies and, and the, uh, the waves. This is the sort of thing that um, Manet would have looked at um, in, in both in his trips to the Netherlands and uh, uh, in the Louvre, there are a few paintings like this. <clears throat> so he's, he's updating that. But what, what was so astonishing, you see this, I mean, it has to be a fantasy. I mean, the ships can be uh, absolutely accurate, but where would an artist stand to see the water like this, which is as if you were actually looking at the water in an aquarium, because it just comes partly up here. And that, remember he started out with a year um, shipping out to South America when his parents were hoping he would be in the merchant marine. That's a view as if you're looking down at the water from shipboard. So it presents a kind of new actuality, something that's not out of the tradition of painting, but out of life. 
So he takes a, a really ah, terribly difficult issue. Like, how do you show water, which is always moving, and that you can plunge right through on a flat canvas in with opaque paints and suggests its reality. Uh, this is, it's actually what Monet will do when he's doing some of the Water Lily series. It's that whole way of how um, you look at that flat surface of water as if it was the flat surface of a canvas. Now, this is also in the mat. I believe this is the last of the Hispanic subjects. I want to bring this to you because I had a, another quote I wanted from it. This is a, called a matador saluting. And um, he'd been to Spain by the time this was done. And it's mm, more, than, more than five feet high. This is Zola. Cezanne's great friend, but also a friend of all the artists of this time. He's talking about paintings like this, the, the ones that look pretty two-dimensional. Um, At first, the eyes sees a broadly applied colors. Soon, the objects define themselves and fall into place. After several seconds, it comes together vigorous and solid, and one is delighted to contemplate clear, sober painting, which renders nature with gentle roughness, if I may so express myself. So I, I read that because it suggests the temporal uh, aspect for uh, people to absorb the novelty of these works of art. They truly didn't know what to see. They didn't know how to see them. They couldn't see the matador. They saw gray and all oh, pink strokes and white down here and what? Oh, I see. That's what that means. You see, we are so inured to this that we just quickly and automatically accept those illusions. Well, where do you get the idea for this? There, there's the matador. Look at the way he just flicks the paint. Wow, this is what, what just confounded and distressed observers is like. Oh. If he's wearing something gray and sort of like mustardy color in here, what's that white stuff? What's, what, what's that on there? Well, we know. And if we go to the Frick, we know even better. It's something like what Velasquez did when he did this. Um, it's called the Fraga Philip, the Philip with this. Uh, of Spain with his marvelous um, uniform and his, actually the baton of office. <clears throat> and the way, here, I have a detail of that. He shows all the embroidery. But he, when Velasquez does it, you can sort of discern what the pattern was of the embroidery on there, the applique. Here, no, these are just flecks of color. You, you don't have that. And Greg Noah, who was still painting at that time, he, it wasn't the time of the Franco-Prussian War, so he's, he's still active. Now, he's painting that very loosely too, but this is understandable. Oh, well, this is a, like a satiny taffety top. And those are just the lights being um, thrown back at us from it. It's not just the flex. And what about this marvelous ear? It's in place, and of course his beard might have come around that, but he's also taking that as an isolated shape and playing with that. So it just doesn't cohere in the good old way. This one I imagine is familiar to some people. I know it's, I've seen it in postcards and 
posters. And it's just called the Pfeiffer. Here, okay. That gave you the size, and then here's the image. This is about same time, about mid mid eighteen sixties. And it was a, a boy that he saw in the Imperial Regiment, who was a, a Pfeiffer, and he had come pose for him. Now he's pushing what he's learned from Velasquez and observed even further, because how does he suggest any depth at all? Not much. A shadow from one foot, and perhaps even by showing the signatures if that's slanting on recession. And a very slight shift in the color here. Whereas the figure seems even flatter because you have the black stripe of his pants and the black around here and around his outline. Where did he get the daring to do this? Oh, well, in 1861, so five years earlier, a woman had for the first time opened a shop in Paris that sold Japanese woodblock prints. Uh, this is a scroll that's in the British Museum showing a, a purported portrait of one of the great um, artists, of Udomaro, from the beginning of the 19th century. But it would be images like this. In a void. So this is a new possibility. He's going outside the Western tradition. And that goes about as two-dimensional as he ever goes. He talks elsewhere about how he is still trying to present this sense that there's an atmosphere around the figure. So for that, you need to consider the very subtle modulations in the color all around, which after all, this all has to be painted as well. As if there's some light, some penumbra, as if the setting is actually more three-dimensional than the figure. Give you another one of his, I'm, I'm bound and determined to make sure that I get to one particular painting today. But another time when he's working with uh, current events, there's a, a feature of everything we've looked at uh, it seems to me is that you never get a sense of uh, Manet's um, emotional investment in anything he's showing. It's as if he's as neutral an observer or um, I, I think of it in very personal terms. If he has a father who's a judge and his mother comes from a family of diplomats, plus he's upper class French, he has been schooled from infancy in learning to have that kind of discreet, very, very private life uh, so that you can banter and be a marvelously sociable creature and you don't betray yourself at all. Um, but this one, it seems uh, it's an unfinished painting and that probably increases the sense of that um, as if maybe something more is going on with this. This is one of four versions he did of an event that horrified him. It was the execution of um, Maximilian of Austria, whom um, the <clears throat> Napoleon III of France had put on the throne in Mexico and then simply abandoned him. So he... he was soon deposed and executed with two of his loyal uh, cabinet members. So the word of the execution came back to Manet, and he started then. Now, this is a large painting, this, this unfinished one. This is a, 
again, about six feet high. That's about all that would be comfortable for a, a person to be painting standing up. Um, and you see, he's roughed it out. He, he hasn't, he, he sends letters to his friends, you know, tell me anything you can find, any images of it. Because he doesn't know how were they dressed, you know, what, what, what do, how does um, Mexican firing squad, what do they look like? What kind of hats do they wear? What kinds of guns do they have? Because he wanted to give in painting the same kind of descriptiveness that there could be in a, a photograph. And this certainly follows up on that Courbet, anything that, that is in a newspaper can be, become the subject of a painting. So how does he even envision it like this? <laughs> it's as if reality gets filtered through art for him. It's Goya's execution of May 3rd, 1808. When the local of Madrid rebelled against um, French troops who were occupying the land. It's one of the very horrifying images. It's the impersonality of the firing squad and the absolute personalization of the victims, who also, you will notice, are in varying sizes. So that's how he's generally deployed the canvas here. This man will be the executioner of, of Maximilian with his gun. Then he did another a version, a great big version, which is in the um, National Gallery in um, London. And this is one that left him unsatisfied. So he cut it up into pieces. Well, the pieces were saved. So uh, after his death, um, the, his, his family um, sold them. So you get parts of it. This would be, so the, it would be Maximilian was over here. And there was yet another version. And this is the final one. You see he's changed uniforms, changed hats, now presented with figures looking on as almost as if this were looking into the bull ring. and the absolutely stoical behavior of Maximilian, which was reported to be true. So in this painting, I don't think it conveys much feeling, but it's meant to certainly evoke feeling. So you see, this, this is, again, he's moving into new territory, doing new things. A lovely portrait of his wife. Um, as I said, she was a fine musician. She played, in fact, when Baudelaire was, uh, who'd led quite a dissolute life, he had a stroke and he was hospitalized in Paris for the very end of his life. And uh, she would go and play uh, Wagner to him. So this is Monet's kind of loving tribute to his wife. So you have the world stage, and now you get something completely intimate. If you saw some years ago when there was a show of Monet at the Met, this, this painting was present. It's called The Balcony, and it's in the Musée d'Orsay from 1868-1869. So this would be one that was showing contemporary life of um, women who would not be out on the street, certainly not on their own, but generally looking at the city from their balconies and observing what's going on because they are still 
upper class women and leading a quite sheltered life. Uh, <clears throat> but this is no scene from the life. This is all um, composed in the studio. So it's a, a faux reality being presented here. The three figures, um, this was a friend of his who was a painter and who later on uh, worked quite hard to find buyers for Manet's paintings. This young woman was a violinist who often played with Madame Manet in their evening concerts. And this is, uh, will be one of Manet's very good friends who becomes a leading impressionist painting, Bert Morisot, M-O-R-I-S-O-T. And then back here, you just barely make out there's a youngster that's Manet's, well, Leon, Leonoff, so it's possibly his son, but certainly his wife's son in the background. I couldn't find a really good color reproduction. This is a quite cool blue-green, um, more like the color of the sea that he showed. And I have some details. This face, her face, and this section. Now, this is an, an account of the condition of modern life. These three figures, who again make a kind of a triangle, each one is totally isolated in her, his own thoughts, right? They don't look at the same thing. She does seem to look out here sort of toward us. No. looking inward, not out at, down at anything on the boulevard down below. And she has her little dog with a bow in its head there and a great rhododendron in a pot. <clears throat> Based, once again, on art, not just life in France. And this is one that uh, is part of the collection of the Met two machas on a, on a balcony. Now you see how loosely it paints. This is one thing for which the young artists, especially admired Manet in his technical prowess of <clears throat> painting that one color on top of another um, with just quick flex and then sometimes merging it. How do you know when to blend then, when not to? It's, it's having to learn a whole new way to work. He's dispensed with the fingers for this hand. It's just something where this very well-drawn hand can rest. So we assume a hand like that is here. Here's a young girl, the violinist. Even just smudges of color for her eyes. as opposed to Bert Morisot, who is the, clearly, um, well, I think it's clear that she is the center of Manet's focus in this work. These very large eyes and the upward look. So and she's, she's not looking at anything. She's just alert, but not observing. I think I'll leave that on just for the moment here. 
because there comes a, a break in Manet's career, not intentional, 1870, that's the time of the Franco-Prussian War. Monet, Cicely, I think even Renoir for a while, they all leave Paris. Paris was under siege. Uh, and they went to France, I mean, to London. And that's going to have to do with the formation of Impressionism. Manet and Degas, the two um, men highest in the social standing in the group, <clears throat> well, actually, all the men have high social standing, then Basile will too, they stayed. And um, Manet was a um, lieutenant general in the sort of the National Guard in Paris. Well, they they came from the class that commanded, so they were there to command rather than than to fight. So he sent his family away and, and he stayed. He does some wonderful lithographs of, of the scenes of fighting in Paris. And he was there during the terrible um, days of the suppression of the Paris Commune, when it was just wholesale slaughter. But so he saw all those war events. He was unscathed by them, but he 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 certainly had to think of, me, of many other things. And after the seventy, then now we're in the seventies. There is a, a kind of a change. <clears throat> and it's somewhat visible in this one, and this is just called the railroad. And this is 1872, 1873, again in the National Gallery in Washington. Uh, it's not quite four feet across. So we're going down a smaller scale. These are not paintings necessarily intended to make a great statement in the salon and to get rejected from the salon. But now he's finding alternate places to show them. And there was a move toward uh, so increasingly being paintings are being sold to people of the middle class who have smaller living quarters. The paintings need to adapt in their dimensions as well. So he does this one of the railroad. It's a quite an enigmatic painting. This is Gar Saint Lazare, which we'll see Monet made great poetry out of the steam from the engines here. But this is just steam in the backdrop. And what's going on? Well, it's a very well-dressed young girl. When it's known who she was, with their hands on the rail, looking through at the activity down here. You can just see, I think there may be two, uh, maybe a third person, very tiny of workers down here on the tracks little tiny flecks of red. She has a little bit of red in her earring. There's a bunch of grapes over here on this little stone ledging. And is this her nanny, possibly her au pair? This girl must be a fall scene because she's wearing this fairly heavy clothing a little bit of red in her fan. She's just looked up from her reading. Here's this nice little pup. Must be an early outing for this little pup still, snoozing in her arm. She's looking at us in a very questioning way. And again, that is Victorine Murant. That's the same model as in Olympia and in Luncheon on the Grass. So it's the urban environment of well-dressed people doing what? Against a very regular background here, where some people say, oh, that comes from Japanese prints, because it's quite common. And it may be, now he's not incorporating Western art, but Asian art and contemporary reality. With her ever present. See, just a little tiny bit of red. Over here.
This is in the Philadelphia Museum. This he submitted to the Sun, and it was a success, a great success, because it looks the most traditional. There's nothing confrontational about this, at least on the surface. It's called Le Bon Boc. Boc is um, the ale that he's drinking. And this was a, a model. Some people might have known him. It was a printmaker who posed for it. Uh, Manet talked about how this was a very difficult painting to do, how you can put just one people in there, one person in there, and make atmosphere around it and make the whole painting interesting. So he's again pushing himself for challenges. Um, there is a kind of a message in here people would have recognized that <clears throat> there was a society called the Bon Boc Society of them. Um, it was kind of a social political event. Um, I think it was monthly, uh, a dinner with lots of beer. Uh, um, a collective of artists, writers, and uh, I think publishers primarily. And they sort of lived out the aspects of German life that were now cut off because the German parts of France had been annexed by the Prussians. So it has a kind of an overtone of those, the wartime, but it's just this looking at like a very jolly fellow and looking very much like, not as manically jolly as this guy, but 17th century Dutch painting. And he had just come back from a trip to, um, to Holland. So he, all of this was very fresh on his mind. And then this, this is not a famous painting by him. It's just called the croquet game. And uh, croquet party, 1873. This looks so different, certainly so different from the railroad with that uh, very clear structure, those uh, figures sort of toward the frontal plane, looking toward us, very large. And it, these are people outdoors in a landscape, and it's very, very, very loosely painted. The figures just brushed in there. Um, the size on this is like uh, three and a half feet long and a little more than two feet high. So it's a small painting. It's something completely different. And you can say, ah, oh, it looks like an impressionist painting. Well, this is the time when he is beginning to experiment with the art you're going to be more familiar with henceforth. Um, the, I'm sure you know already um, the impressionist technique of this very loose flecking brushwork, which is characteristic, especially of uh, Monet and, and Renoir. And the scene of life in the out of doors, as if the easel has, the artist just set us easel up here, gotten out his tube of paints, is sitting down, catching the light on these figures and seeing the, the air all around in somebody's garden, even with a watering can here. I believe this was done in the studio. This was actually a friend of his, a painter who was posed for him, um, who never worked in anything like an impression style. Here's the same woman, that's Victorine, his favorite model. The name of this model is known also, and this was a friend of his over here. So he's had four people pose for him independently, and then he puts them together to create a game, which was very popular at that time, a scene as if they were actually playing in the out of doors. So it's the spontaneity um, is something put here deliberately. But he is wanting to pay attention to, oh, how, how would light 
you know, hit the brim of the hat on her sleeve, the back of her knuckles. Now, very loosely painted this is. Well, this, this is in the Met. I, I think it's not on, on display now. Or not. Used to be always out. It's just called Boating. It's 1874. In the summer of 1874, he um, went to the family property. It's right along the Seine. It was right opposite where um, Monet and Renoir were spending the summer. So he got together with him a lot. And they, um, not only socially, but they painted together somewhat. And so it's in these years, 73, 74, Manet really tries out for himself the next new thing, which was working in that Impressionist style. But what is unlike what we think of Impressionist style anyway, these are still very large figures, but it's now an outdoor scene where it's saturated with sunlight and this quick, quick working technique. Oh, Manet loves women's uh, clothing, millinery, shoes. He, he, he was really fascinated by them. And he's, she's very up to date here. And again, he's playing with, oh, canvas, just as with the Kearsarge in Alabama. You have water with the shifts in the color. As you look off, you lose the strokes blends off in here. No sky, but still you get the idea that that's his depth. And I don't want to do that one now. Uh, so one afternoon he went over to visit Ma, uh, Monet with his wife and little son. And they set it up. So Monet painted Monet. Monet painted Monet, and Renoir came on the scene a little bit late, borrowed a paint, uh, canvas, took a canvas, took some paint, some tubes, and then he painted also. So the three of them were working together. This one is um, two feet high, and it's in the mat, so you can go enjoy it. And now he's working in this. Very deft shorthand style, like the Impressionists. So interested in the lights, even flickering from the back here, backlit in the bushes. Little bits of red, the rooster flowers. Monet, always interested in his flowers. And here's Renoir's. which is much more a quick sketch. But you get the sense of the three of them together. We are still, we will, I will have one painting, two paintings to show you at the beginning of next class one the undoubtedly the greatest by him and but let me just flick by you several that he did in the later 70s I mean, he, remember he dies in 1883 and by 1880 uh his illness is beginning to affect him and he um is not as mobile and he tends to work on smaller things most of the time but this is one of his uh, Still larger ones, this is about five feet high, and it's called Nana or Nana. And it's it's, it's a, the scene of the life then. It wasn't actually based on the novel, which Zola writes by that name. He hadn't written the novel yet. But it's showing a prostitute. I, unfortunately, I will have to look for another image because what's missing over here is that there's her patron. You just see his hand. And you really do need to get to see his face. But she's very saucy looking at us. All these great curves around her, great rump. All the stuff around here. 
cis playing on femininity and a woman who's uh, of the demimonde, but as a she. This is just called the plum. It's a brandy, brandy plum here. Look at the scene of modernity. This girl with her unlit cigarette. As if he's seen it in a cafe, the cafes that he and his buddies always went to. But actually, we know this is a marble table he had in his studio. Now, here there's feeling. It's not necessarily our feeling, but you see from her pose, her sort of pensive feeling. as she looks off. Now, see the well, um, well-bred well young women like Bert Marceau or Mary Cassatt would never be allowed to go out independently like this. So this is very much the modern woman. Well, let me, sh I, this is what you're going to, what we start with next time. It is be the last work of his, it should, was his last big painting. It was by this time, so racked by pain. Um, he could hardly uh, move, especially in his legs that he could paint for just a short period of time and then he had to go lie down. But he does this, the bar of Folies Berger. Some of you may have seen this in London. And this is the same marble table that's in the plum. But this will be his final statement. So there she looks, very different from those early women that we saw. Uh, I will stop, we do this, and then we're gonna move into Impressionism. Okay, the time is up and I am interested in anyone wanting to look at something again. I'll, we'll go back or if you have any questions. Maggie? Yes. It seemed like almost all of his people were dressed in blue or white. Yes. Um, sometimes it is because this, this, the, it's the palette he loves and also that sort of cool green. But um, these are also new colors, um, um, chemically produced colors. So it's a sign of the modernity. It was in their clothing and it's in his paints. Yeah. You're right. Maggie, I have a theory about that painting of the two figures at the train station. Could you go back to oh, that? Oh, I certainly will. Yep. Yeah. Okay. What what hit me out of the blue was that there's it's really the same person. And this woman sitting there is remembering herself as a young girl and what her dreams were about getting out of this town and what her future would be. <laughs> and she's looking up kind of wistfully remembering, well, here I still am doing what I, you know, this boring job. And that little girl was her with all of her youthful dreams. That's what came to me today. Okay. And I and also just this, put in the... This is Victorine Murant again, same old, same old model. Um, and we know who these are, I mean, in reality, but that doesn't have to be, that's just, they're models. That's not what the painting means. I just put in the chat a link to a another program, a Zoom program on Saturday afternoon about Manet, if anyone wants to. Oh, excellent. All again, from a diff, someone else's perspective. Yeah. Because that's the great thing about great artists. There are many perspectives possible.
anymore. I noticed another little bit of red. Oh, he's so cunning, just a little tiny, tiny bits. Look there, there. All right, I'll see you next week then. Thank you. Oh, well, let me check. Thank you. Yes, let's see. Oh, when the colors are dabbed on, he's an impressionist. When the colors are blended, well. Yeah, I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have you all just like, oh, I don't know what impressionism is. I can't believe this is impressionism before we're through. So that sounds good, though. Okay, yeah, go to time and that. Yeah. Okay, well, I will see you next week.